I was very upset because a child was missing and I recognized the mother on the TV and I called and I reported what I witnessed and that I was there and there was no child. Hi everyone, I'm Kevin and this is Just Thought Lounge. We're going to examine a case today about a little boy named Timothy Wiltsey. Back in 1991, Timmy was a bouncy five-year-old that loved the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And on Memorial Day weekend, he was excited to go with his mother to a carnival at Kennedy Park in Sayreville, New Jersey. Before 8pm that night, however, Timothy would be reported missing. The first step in a decades-long nightmare of searching, hoping, and trying to find justice for Timothy. The case spans over 25 years, and I wish I could say it was now closed, but that's unfortunately not yet true. Let's take a look. According to his mother Michelle, Timmy's disappearance on the evening of the 25th of May 1991 seemed to happen inside of only a few quick minutes. That Saturday evening, around 7 p.m., Michelle and Timmy arrived at Kennedy Park in Sayreville for a carnival celebrating Memorial Day. Michelle purchased a handful of tickets so Timmy could get on a few of the carnival rides, then she decided to grab a soda. There was a queue to purchase the soft drink, which she paid for with a $10 bill, so there was extra time spent sorting for change. When Michelle turned around with her soda, she says Timmy was gone. Paid for a soda, I turned around and he was gone. The day before, Michelle had made arrangements to take her 14-year-old niece Jennifer to the carnival as well. Instead of picking her up on the way with Timmy, however, plans shifted and the two were to meet there. When Jennifer arrived with a friend and babysitter of Timmy's, Danielle, they spotted Michelle in the carnival crowd, but she was alone. Michelle tells the two young women that it had been 15 minutes since she had lost sight of Timothy. Jennifer and Danielle immediately began searching and they enlisted the help of a police officer in the park. Michelle spoke to the officer and formally reported Timothy missing. She told the police that Timmy was sporting a crew cut and wearing a t-shirt and new Ninja Turtle sneakers. The search began immediately, of the park, of the surrounding woodland, and everywhere else they could think to find a young boy. Eventually, multiple agencies were pulled in and the state's authorities would send a helicopter and scuba teams to search two ponds in the park. Hundreds of volunteers scoured the 10-acre area alongside hundreds of law enforcement, and they did this for days, but they could not find him. In the days leading up to the carnival at Kennedy Park, there was nothing to indicate impending trouble for Michelle and little Timothy. Michelle had purchased his kindergarten graduation gown, she also got him his new pair of Ninja Turtle sneakers the week before, and the two went shopping for new clothes the day before the event. The young mother was admittedly very tight on money, she had trouble holding down jobs, but had refused to go on welfare. Michelle relied on her father for funds sometimes, but she got by. After receiving some help from family by way of care for Timmy over a couple of months, she managed to pay tuition for him to go to pre-kindergarten at a Catholic school. Timothy's father George was no longer in the picture, and according to him, that was not by choice. After dropping out of high school, Michelle spent some time with her parents in Long Island, where she met a man named George Wiltsey. George and Michelle dated for about three years before they moved together to New Jersey, and here she became pregnant with Timothy. He was born on August 6, 1985. At that time, George was 18 years old, Michelle was 17. The couple had initially moved together to George's home state of Iowa with the baby, but this move proved to be short-lived. After only six months, Michelle moved back to New Jersey, taking Timmy with her, and cut off all contact with George. He never saw his son again after this. George also didn't pay child support, and Michelle would send things back that he had mailed to his son. It's unclear what happened to prompt the split, but George said Michelle was bored with life in Iowa and had little to do. He also admitted to some substance abuse problems that may have contributed to at least one physical encounter with Michelle. In spring 1991, 23-year-old Michelle found herself a single mother to a five-year-old son and struggling to make ends meet. As the sole provider for Timmy, Michelle held a number of different jobs. She worked as a secretary, a paralegal, a receptionist, a bank teller, and in retail. At times, she held two jobs at once. 
As with many single mothers, securing childcare was also a struggle. Nonetheless, many close to Michelle reported that little Timmy was her life, and that she was a doting and loving mother doing everything she could for her son. After Timmy went missing, however, a new conflicting narrative also emerged, one that paints Michelle Ledzinski in a very different light. The FBI administered a lie detector test to Michelle on May 27, 1991, just days after Timothy's disappearance. She failed. A week later, she failed a second test administered by the Middlesex County Prosecutor's Office. The test administrators said she exhibited wide emotional swings, made little or no eye contact, and showed more concern for herself than for her missing child. She kept asking the test administrator, how am I doing? This is a sign of deception, they said. According to the FBI, Michelle even lied to friends afterwards about lying on the polygraphs, telling them she passed. While she waited with friends and neighbors at her home in South Amboy for some word about her son, the people both close to her and via the press began to wonder why she wasn't showing more emotion. Her composed appearance on the news became a source of suspicion in its own right. At Timmy's funeral, those close to Michelle later gave varying accounts of her mental and emotional state. Did you uh, have an opportunity to observe Michelle's demeanor during the funeral? Yes, I did. What was her demeanor then? She was, in, to me, she was in shock. She was kind of just there and she was upset. Her face was all swollen. Did she, did you assist her in any way at the funeral? I did. How so? Um, we walked her up. We had to, my dad and I had to hold her from one side to the other, walking up the stairs of the church. Um, kind of cavalier, uh, worried about which limo she was going to go in, and um, I don't, uh, that's all I really remember about it. She, there was no fears, there was no emotion. Her behavior raised suspicions and encouraged law enforcement to examine Michelle as a suspect even further. In a taped interview with police on the day following Timothy's disappearance, Michelle offered what would be the first of many versions of events that she would offer over the years that followed. While you were in line, were you keeping an eye on him while you were in line? Yes. What was the time period from when you last saw Tim and, uh, and then turned around and he was gone? It would be about two minutes or so. It was like they were taking my money out of my pocket, gave the guy, gave me my change back, sold it, and then turned around and he was gone. Okay, so within this two minute period, Tim disappeared? Mm-hmm, yes. While at Kennedy Park, uh, did you observe anyone paying you any, you or Timothy, any undue attention? Just one of the carnival guys. Look at me a few times. That's all I remember. Did this carnival guy say anything to you? No, he just left. Investigators were to record amended statements from Michelle again on the 6th of June, the next day the 7th, and then again on the 13th, in addition to statements given separately to the state police, all with variations of large and small details including one version in which Michelle suggests that Timmy is being held by kidnappers that will call her in a month's time. The last statement you made relative to the Timothy would be appearing in a month and also you would be getting a phone call. That was not discussed with state police no. personnel at division headquarters, is that correct? Right. Uh, these last two facts, that being the phone call and the possible reappearance of Timothy within a month's time did not come to light until we re-interviewed you here at Cerebro Police Headquarters after the state police interview, is that correct? Yeah. Why it has taken a, a series of successive interviews to bring out all of this additional information pertaining to the uh, disappearance of Tim? I'm afraid to say anything anymore because they made it threat at the tool about me and I don't want to hurt them. And if I said that I was going to get a phone call in a month, and that Timmy would be back in a month, he would be at my house, and I might not get him back. 
Investigators contacted the IRS for help in finding out whether she had tried to sell her son for financial gain. The U.S. Treasury Department, however, was unable to uncover any large transactions tied to her. The FBI sprayed her car with a chemical that could detect the presence of dried blood, but found none. They also couldn't find any blood in the family home. The FBI even got permission from one of her friends, a former boyfriend, to wire his car to see if she would confess any details. Over 11 months of recordings and attempts at gaining incriminating statements from her led to nothing at all of note. Three extensive interrogations with Michelle yielded nothing concrete for the investigators, except for their inconsistencies. The next break in the case came in October of that same year when a school teacher walking in the area of Olympic Drive, near the Raritan Center Industrial Complex, found a child's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles sneaker. Believing it might be related to the case, he provided it to law enforcement. Police were able to match the model number of the sneaker to a shoebox that Michelle provided shortly after Timmy's disappearance. When first shown the sneaker, Michelle said it was not her son's, describing features that distinguished it from the sneakers Timmy was wearing. But in November 1991, she changed her mind, telling authorities that it could be her son's after all. The following spring, the FBI began extensively searching the general area where the sneaker had been found. The area was of further interest when it was discovered that Michelle had failed to disclose as part of her past work history her employment in a building in the Raritan Center complex. A former boyfriend of Michelle's from that time reported that she frequently took lunch break walks along the water in that area when she worked in the complex. On April 23, 1992 and the following day, while searching that area, the FBI found a matching sneaker and a pillowcase. Approximately 150 yards away and across Olympic Drive, they found Timmy's skeletal remains in the stagnant water of Red Root Creek, a tributary of the Raritan River. They also discovered remnants of his clothing, a shovel, and a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles balloon, like Timmy sometimes kept in his bedroom at home. That we had found the remains of the human skull, and, that it, and most probably it was that of Timothy. What was her reaction? was no reaction. Did she say anything? No, sir. Did you display any emotion at all? No, sir. Approximately 25 feet above the remains, embedded in the soil in the bank of the creek, FBI found a blue blanket with multicolored metallic fibers. Although testing on the blanket revealed nothing of value. Hair fragments from the items were examined microscopically and compared against Michelle's, but they did not match. Neither Michelle or anyone in the family questioned at that time could identify the blanket. In 1992, the prosecutor's office declined to bring charges against Michelle. The medical examiner determined that the cause of death was a homicide, but it was never determined of what nature or what the cause of death was. It remained unclassified. Michelle moved out of state and started a new life, but this would not be the last that we heard of her, nor would she slip off the authorities' radar. In September 1994, at the age of 26, Michelle found herself back in the national news. She claimed that two federal agents had abducted her from outside of her apartment building at gunpoint, forced her into her car, and then drove her to Detroit, where they eventually set her free. She told the FBI that the two men named Segrix and John had called on her several times, saying they were federal agents and asking her to cooperate in the investigation of a former police officer who was suspected of harassing her. Her story was found to be a complete hoax. She pled guilty to federal charges for making false statements and admitted to taking a bus to Detroit herself. In addition, she was charged with having copied the agency's seal. Michelle had been given business cards by FBI agents after her son's disappearance and, according to investigators, she had the agency seal copied for a business card for a fake Michael Segrix after she returned from Detroit. She had one of the cards put on her apartment door with the message, See you soon, it's not over, to support her claim that she had been kidnapped. In March 1995, Michelle was sentenced to six months of house arrest in order to seek counseling. Timothy's case remained dormant until in June 2011, Sergeant Scott Croco of the Middlesex County Prosecutor's Office reopened the investigation. The sergeant determined that if he was able to link one or more of the items recovered with Timmy's remains, the blanket or the pillowcase, to Michelle, that would be powerful evidence. In the intervening years, Michelle had married briefly in Minnesota and had a son. 
When the marriage fell apart in 2003, she moved to Florida, pregnant with her second son, and bought a home there. She was settled with her two boys in Port St. Lucie, Florida, and worked as a paralegal for a law firm. She kept out photos of Timmy and let her sons know that they had had a brother. She kept hope alive that there would be a breakthrough in the case. Back in New Jersey, Sergeant Croco showed the blanket found at the bank of the creek to Michelle's niece, Jennifer, who had become estranged from her aunt. Jennifer immediately identified the blue blanket as coming from Michelle's apartment more than 20 years earlier. In August 2014, 23 years after Timmy's disappearance, a Middlesex County grand jury indicted Michelle Ledzinski in a single count, charging her with first-degree murder of her son. The trial proceeded between March and May 2016. The only significant new evidence acquired in the more than 20 years between the first and second investigation was Jennifer's identification of the blanket. On the eve of the trial, in the midst of saturated pretrial publicity, two former babysitters also identified the blanket. It was a specific anybody blanket. I just think it was a blanket in the house. Whose house? Michelle's house. Timothy's house. Where would you sleep at Miss Lazinski's apartment? Would you use that blanket? I believe I used the blanket before. When I would snuggle up with Timothy. At trial, a number of witnesses intimately familiar with Michelle's residences during the relevant time period did not identify the blanket. No such blanket appeared in any of the photographs of her apartments. Investigators had also submitted the hair fragments from the blanket and pillowcases for DNA testing, going much further than the 1991 microscopic tests, but none of them matched Michelle. The state's case relied heavily on the blanket to tie Michelle to the murder, but emphasis was also placed on the young mother's behavior and demeanor in the aftermath of the disappearance. Her apparent composure throughout was repeatedly pointed to as a reason to believe she was hiding something. Another compelling piece of circumstantial evidence was the location where Timmy was found. Timmy's remains were found in a creek, in a marsh, off of Olympic Drive. What you're going to find in here is that this creek where Timmy's remains were found was literally right around the corner from where Michelle Lazinski used to work. There were two major storms between the 25th of May 1991 when Timothy was reported missing and April 1992 when his remains were found. Experts testified that a swollen Raritan River could have risen and impacted the movement of the evidence. These storms could have carried Timmy from another area to where he was found in the creek off of Olympic Drive. These considerations expanded the potential search area, experts said. It was noted that 90% of Timothy's remains were still missing. The state's theory of what happened rested on the premise that Timmy did not go missing at the carnival at Kennedy Park at all, but in fact was never even there. Aside from Michelle, the last sighting of Timmy from people who knew him were neighbors who spotted him with his mother the evening before the carnival and that morning. I was very upset because a child was missing and I recognized the mother on the TV and I called and I reported what I witnessed and that I was there and there was no child. In response, the defense produced several witnesses who claimed to have seen a young boy generally fitting Timmy's description at the carnival that night, thereby refuting the state's major contention that Timmy was never at the carnival and that he was likely already dead at that point. Uh, I saw a uh, young boy fitting description of Timothy Okay, And where did you see him? On my ride. Describe the boy that you saw that day. Young boy, about five years old. Um, 
tank top shorts. He had a Teenage Mutant Ninja shirt. She was on. Michelle's versions of events offered to law enforcement were so inconsistent they became one of the most significant pieces of evidence for the prosecution. At trial, the jury heard multiple variations of her soda story in which Timmy disappeared while she made the purchase. On June 6, 1991, Michelle told authorities that two men abducted Timmy. Michelle described these men but did not know who they were. Initially, she claimed they just disappeared with Timmy. In a later version, she said one of the men threatened her with a knife and told her not to say anything or they would harm Timmy. And eventually she gave us a story. What was that? That Timmy was on a ride and when she looked away, two men had, a, a man was taking him off of the ride after it stopped. And he told her, stay away or I will hurt him. And he joined another man, they were walking away from her. What'd she tell you this time? Told us that Timothy was, uh, she is, was walking there and she met a girl she knew from when she was at bank. She believed her name was Ellen and she was a go-go girl. She wanted to go get the soda. So, and Timothy was uh, fidgeting, crying. He wanted to go on a rise. Ellen said, I'll watch him till you get back. Uh, she said she stated to Ellen, do you really want to do that? And she said, yes. She then left the boy with uh, Ellen and the two men and went and got her soda at the concession stand. I asked her specifically about the incident with the man with a knife. She had spoken about a man holding a knife on her and threatening her. So she went to the concession stand uh, following his orders. And I asked her why she just didn't stand there and scream and pardon the French, but raise hell um, if the knife was on her and not on Timmy. And she hesitated for a second and then said, well, I thought maybe the man with Timmy had a knife on him as well. And I called her back a little while later and she had told me a different story than what she said previously on the 25th. What did she tell you this time? She had said that she was at the carnival with Timmy and there was a woman there with a man and a little girl. And Timmy was on a ride and she ran out of money and she wanted to go get more money at her car. So for some reason, the woman, the man, the child, and Timmy all walked to her car, she had told me. And she said that when they were at the car, the woman pulled a knife and put it to Timmy, and, and she took him in the car and they drove off. And it just, it left me a little bit perplexed. And, uh, Michelle Ledzinski suffered from a mixed personality disorder with antisocial traits in 1991 when her son allegedly disappeared, according to a forensic psychologist. The doctor said that based on her symptoms and behaviors, he determined that she had a mixed personality disorder with borderline and antisocial traits. He said she had abandonment issues, adding that she had called a former boyfriend 1,200 times in one week before he took her to court. He said her lies weren't little white lies, but rather extraordinary lies, including the lie she told in 1994 about being allegedly kidnapped by the FBI. That kidnapping episode was not introduced at trial. The state contended that Michelle killed Timmy, a child she bore out of wedlock at a very young age because she was struggling financially and emotionally. They introduced evidence of Timmy's frequent absences and tardiness from school. Was Timmy Lee? Very often to school. Okay. Michelle sometimes brought Timmy with her to job sites because she could not find a babysitter, and she moved from job to job, staying only a short period of time before leaving to find another. The state also argued that Michelle's behavior after the fact was demonstrative of her motive. Prosecutors showed evidence that Michelle had romantic involvement with a married man shortly after Timmy's disappearance and other cavalier conduct, including her behavior during various interviews with law enforcement and at Timmy's funeral. Michelle's own family was divided. While her sister and father testified that she was a good mother who simply doesn't show a lot of emotion, her brother Michael supported the prosecution, as did her niece Jennifer. In the days after Timmy went missing, did you speak with Michelle? Every day. What was her demeanor on those days that she spoke with her? Upset, distraught. 
did did uh, she indicate to you anything about how she was getting along? She wasn't sleeping or eating. Michelle noticed a pair of Ninja Turtle sneakers in a very dark, dark church um, from way across the room. But then I found out that she could not recognize her own son's shoe and was placed in front of her, which caused me great concern. The defense's star witness at trial was a man named Damien Dowdle, an Arizona man who claimed that his jail cellmate, Bernard McShane, once told him about murdering a boy in a park. Dowdle initially told authorities that the slaying had happened in Georgia because he remembered McShane saying it was in Atlanta City. Later, another jail cellmate suggested to Dowdle that McShane may have actually been referring to Atlantic City. He had noted the place had many casinos and was by the water. But Atlantic City is nearly 100 miles from Raritan Center. Damien Dowdle himself, a convicted bank robber, said McShane told him in 1991 that he killed a little boy at a park where a large event was taking place nearby, and Dowdle always believed that story to be true. Dowdle spent 18 more years in prison in connection with three armed bank robberies. When he was released in March 2015, he did some computer research and found similarities between McShane's story to the Wiltsey case that he found unsettling, and went to authorities with what his cellmate had told him. McShane also testified denying everything. Did you tell him that people were looking for that little boy? No. No. And that you killed him? No. Dowdle's testimony was not enough to create reasonable doubt with the jury, and in May 2016, Michelle was found guilty of killing her young son 25 years earlier, and she was given a 30-year sentence. I want to give you a chance to say something if you want to. Because this might be the last time I ever see you. So do you want to say something to me, Michelle? Is this Shortly after the verdict, jurors told local news media that they were initially split 10 to 2 on whether to find her guilty of murder, but the two holdouts who said there was not enough evidence to vote guilty said they still believed Michelle was lying about her son. They were eventually persuaded to find her guilty. The jurors were swayed in part by testimony about her changing story about her son's disappearance at the time and the presence of the blanket found near his remains that babysitters testified had been in her apartment. Michelle's defense team initially sought an outright acquittal on lack of evidence. There was, as your honor knows, no physical evidence linking Ms. Lutzinski to the death of her son, not in her house, not in her car, both of which were searched multiple times. Two medical examiners independently reviewed the case and were unable to determine a cause of death. So ever, both the juries heard his theory, heard his defense, and they rejected it. Defense then appealed the decision to the state Supreme Court, arguing, amongst other factors, that there was no evidence to indicate how little Timmy had died at all. The medical examiner who examined the remains at the scene but died before trial could not reach a conclusion about the cause of Timmy's death. Purposeful, negligent, accidental, reckless. There are a variety of standards that come into play when convicting somebody for a homicide, and there was no proof uh, as to any one of those characterizations. The case then went to the state Supreme Court, which split in a highly unusual 3-3 tie over whether to uphold the verdict. The Chief Justice recused himself from the case as he had been connected to the first investigation, so the court had no judge to break the tie. Under court rules, a tie meant the verdict was upheld and Michelle would remain in prison. But her attorneys went back to court to argue that was unfair and her case should be heard by seven justices, which it ultimately was. When the final decision was handed down, it was by a 4-3 vote to overturn the conviction. The opinion stated that even if the evidence suggested that Timmy did not die by accident, no testimony or evidence was offered to distinguish whether he died by neglect or by a purposeful act of a person, even if that person was his mother. Hours after the New Jersey Supreme Court vacated her murder conviction and after over seven years in custody, Michelle was released back to her sons and home in Florida. The Supreme Court had outright rejected the prosecution's argument for motive. They said, 
It is not uncommon for a 23-year-old single mother raising a child on her own to have financial and social challenges. That singularly unremarkable scenario hardly indicates a motive to murder one's child. The court has rejected the very type of generalized class assumptions offered to the jury as a motive to commit a crime. Responding to the release, Michelle's brother Michael said that the jury got it right when they convicted his sister. He said the appeals court believe they have righted some great wrong, but all they did was rob justice from a little boy. Shame on them. That was the story of Michelle Ladzinski and the ongoing case of little Timothy Wiltsey. Let me know what you think about this one in the comments. I'm Kevin, this is Just Thought Lounge, and I'll see you in the next one.